It is great to be here in Sarasota. Uh, I hope there's a couple of things left to say about Paul Rudolph. I mean, so many extraordinary things have been said already today, and uh, it was a little bit amazing for me to see that film in which some young architecture critic with a beard appeared. Um, <laughs> I don't know who he, who he is or what he, had, what he was doing there, but anyway. Um, this is, of course, where his first important work was done, the city where his reputation was earned. Sarasota, of course, is where he created the buildings that would ultimately be his most famous, the ones that would be considered, found himself as an architect, where he would set the pattern for his career, where he formed the foundation for everything else. In fact, you could really say that Sarasota for Paul Rudolph was kind of like Oak Park for Frank Lloyd Wright. Both communities in which a young architect produced a great deal of important work, mostly but not entirely residential, within a short period of time that today, looking back, astonishes us with its cohesion, its ability to show that something brilliant and lasting was being created. Now, of course, at Oak Park, just outside of Chicago, we can, of course, credit the vibrant architectural culture of Chicago, as well as the presence of Frank Lloyd Wright's mentor, Louis Sullivan, for contributing to Wright's great achievement that we see here. The conditions in Sarasota were not quite so favorably inclined toward the making of good architecture, which, in a way, makes Rudolph's accomplishment here all the more remarkable. He was at the center of a group of other architects, men like Ralph Twitchell, who he came to work for early on, who became his partner, and of course, Carl Abbott and Jack West and William Rupp, all of whom, as you in this room surely know better than I do, came along with Rudolph and a few other people to constitute a small but important school in post-war American architecture, the Sarasota School. Now, but my hope today is not to focus on Sarasota for all its importance, but to use the occasion of Rudolf Centennial, he would have been 100 less than a month ago, to look at the whole arc of his career and to look beyond it at the whole question of his reputation that we just touched on a moment ago in the, in the panel and how it has waxed and waned both during his lifetime and since his death in 1997. Rudolf, to come right to the point, is a difficult architect. His work, particularly his later work, when he moved beyond Sarasota and became a world figure, is not always easy to like. There is a harshness to a lot of it, a roughness, even an arrogance. The Rudolph we see in Sarasota in these brilliant early houses is lighter, more nimble in feeling, and easier to like than the Rudolph that the world saw as he moved on from here and established his career in New Haven and then for most of his mature time as an architect in New York. Now, a few weeks ago, I had a fascinating conversation with the Sarasota journalist Harold Bubel who asked in the course of our interview whether I saw a resemblance between Paul Rudolph and Howard Roark, the architect hero of Ayn Rand's famous and, I think, utterly meretricious novel, The Fountainhead. I said that Rudolph was much better than Howard Roark, that he was much more of a true humanist, and he cared much more about delighting people and was not so convinced of his own genius that he could not see beyond his own forms, but that I could understand how people could see something a little Roarchian, so to speak, about Paul Rudolph, and that the real sadness of Paul Rudolph was that he made it too easy to mistake him for Howard Roark. He did too good an imitation of Howard Roark, even though he was not anywhere near that one-dimensional fount of arrogance of Ayn Rand's character. Perhaps because he let the world think he was more like Roark than he was, even though Roark 
Rudolph, as an architect, was remarkably consistent, perceptions of him varied radically. People saw him as the embodiment of genius and as the embodiment of evil, sometimes at the same time, sometimes in sequence. His reputation went up and down throughout his life. You might say that if Rudolph's career could be represented by a fairly straight line rather than by distinct and fully separate periods, his reputation, by the way he was seen by the world, the outside world, would be more of a sine curve, undulating up and down in great sweeping arcs. It's a further tragedy of Rudolph's life that his consistency, which I think we now consider looking back to have been one of his strengths, was not perceived as that during his lifetime. He seemed to be an architect who in the latter part of his career was out of sync with where the rest of the world was going, who changed little as the rest of the world was changing a great deal, and who seemed uninterested or unwilling to waver from ideas that appeared with every passing year in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s to be more and more out of touch. Now, I find this tragic, not because Rudolph did not change, quite the contrary. It was a tragedy because the world of architecture didn't recognize his consistency as a strength and saw him in the last decades of his life as a marginal figure rather than as the vital force that he had been believed to be earlier and in so many ways truly was still. And it was tragic because, as I'll explain, there were many things about Rudolph's underlying view of what architecture was and could be that were not as different as they seemed from the architecture that was putting him on the sidelines. So the, this talk will be partly about Rudolph, but I think it'll also be about the culture of architecture and about Rudolph's connection to one time, the early 1950s in Sarasota, and his ability to use it as a springboard to play a major role in shaping a later time, the 1960s, in all of American architecture. And then about the inability of later decades to understand and recognize him. Now, I put myself in that latter category. Since my career began in the 1970s, just as Rudolph's was, we might say, cresting. It was just when he was beginning to be viewed a little less as the vital creative force in American architecture that he had been, and more as a marginal figure who might have been making beautiful modernist compositions, but who had not much to do with the new direction of architecture in the 1970s as people were moving away from the heroic ambitions of modernism and seeking something more modest, or at least claiming to. Architecture in the 50s and 60s, as we know, seemed to want to reinvent the world. And much like America itself in the post-World War II years, it came in the 60s to think that bigger and stronger and flashier was almost always better. That changed, of course, after the 60s. In the decades of the 70s and 80s, architecture became preoccupied not with trying to invent a new world, but with rediscovering the world of the past, often through the mimicking of many elements of it and integrating them into a new architecture. The idea of a weekend devoted to celebrating modernism, as we're doing now in Sarasota, wouldn't have been easy to conceive of in those years, when architecture was making a fetish of trying to break away from modernism and to appear more respectful of the past. Modernism, as represented by Rudolph, was in those days seen as somewhat overbearing. And Rudolph was seen as among its most overbearing practitioners. The big thing in architecture then was to find a corrective to all of this big and bold stuff. Now, you notice I've failed to use two obvious and pretty common terms here. I've not, so far, described the modernism of Paul Rudolph with the word brutalism or neo-brutalism, which is how it's often described. And maybe even more important, I have avoided using that hated word postmodernist here. But maybe I should throw in the towel so far as 
those terms are concerned and bring them into the conversation. Actually, there's nothing wrong with talking about Paul Rudolph in terms of brutalism, which is mature period, what we might call high Paul Rudolph certainly was. But since brutalism is so often associated with other people's awful concrete buildings that have none of the subtlety, none of the lyricism, none of the poetry of Rudolph, I hate to associate him with all of that, which is why I use that term a little bit reluctantly. He was so much better, so very much better than most of the other brutalists whose architecture could almost never sing. Rudolph almost always sings, whatever else you may think of it. So while I, I agree that his architecture could be called brutalist, that term does sell him short. Now, as for postmodernism, well, that's what I was talking about before and what Rudolph himself, of course, referred to in that bizarre statement after the film, that attempt, sometimes sincere, but just as often disingenuous, to make architecture seem modest and respectful of history and not arrogant and harsh and cold and grandiose. This is the movement that Rudolf so disdained and that did so much to make him feel marginal to what was going on in architecture. We might even go so far as to say that postmodernism is what rendered Paul Rudolf a tragic figure. It's certainly postmodernism that made it difficult for me as a young critic in the 1970s and 80s to fully appreciate Rudolph's genius. To many of us then entranced with the fresh ideas of Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, Charles Moore, and many others, Rudolph seemed a bit of a relic. He seemed to be stuck in a romantic futurism, his architecture a kind of Buck Rogers view of the world distant from the concerns of the real world, perhaps noble in its intentions, but disconnected from the everyday life of the city and indeed of the lives of the people who might use his buildings. Well, it's a complicated business to dissect this misreading, but let me try. It's complicated in part because it's based somewhat in truth. There is something absolutely distant from the real world in some of Rudolph as you can see from such wild and futuristic plans as his scheme for a linear city to go atop the never-built Lower Manhattan Expressway. But at the same time, this view misreads Rudolph, who probably deserved far less than anyone else in that age to be dismissed as a heroic modernist concerned more with pure form-making than with the real world of both history and urban context that Venturi and others had opened up our eyes to. In those years, many of us thought that if there was any kind of heroic figure in modern architecture who had any degree of street cred, it was probably Louis Kahn, the profound and haunting modernist whose work always seemed to have a primal quality to it. Kahn was the guiding saint of postmodernism, at least a partial inspiration to it, although the trivial and cute and superficial architecture that ultimately came to overwhelm postmodernism's more serious intentions could not be less Kahn-like. But to go back again to Rudolph, we have a kind of double challenge. Did he misunderstand the changing currents of the age, or did the age misunderstand him? Did he reject the architecture world that was beginning to take shape in the 1970s and 80s? or did it reject him? The answer, I think, is some of both. Rudolph wanted no part of what was going on in those decades, and it wanted no part of him. Or most of it wanted no part of him. A few loyal clients, most famously the Bass family in Fort Worth, believed in him and gave him important commissions. But the disconnect between Rudolph and the currents of American architectural thought, oh, sorry, here's Kahn, is tragic, not only because it is sad, but because it was so unnecessary. If Rudolph misread Venturi, and here we see Venturi on the left and a Rudolph house on the right, and thought of them as superficial, they were also misreading Rudolph at the same time, seeing only 
the heroic ambition of his buildings and not the carefully wrought urbanism, seeing only the mon monumentality and not the contextualism, seeing only the boldness and not the lyricism. Rudolph understood history as well as any postmodernist and integ integrated it into his work as subtly as Kahn. He somehow never got credit for this, or if he did, it was overshadowed by other perceptions of him and what his architecture represented. In Rudolph, we see not just the anti-postmodernist, but also the proto-postmodernist, which is why his career is so paradoxical, but also so compelling. We might even go so far as to say everything people have said about Paul Rudolph was true, the bad and the good. His architecture was arrogant and often insistently sculptural, and it could be indifferent to basic practical needs. And yet he understood so much and saw so much and cared so much. And he didn't really disagree with the postmodernist belief in the importance of knowing the past and the importance of understanding the urban context and building in relationship to it. And he certainly understood sustainability before that was a word. And he was interested in ordinary things and in the relationship of popular culture to high culture. He played with a lot of that before other people too. So why was it that he and the architectural culture of the 70s and 80s and 90s seemed so much at war with each other? I hope over the next few minutes we can try to answer that. It's a poignant moment to do so since just a few weeks ago we marked the death of Robert Venturi who was in many ways, the philosophical inspiration of postmodernism and whose career seemed in so many ways the antithesis of Rudolph's. But they were not really opposites and did not have to be a zero-sum game as it turned out to be. Let me now step back and just give you the tiniest bit of biographical detail, maybe unnecessary here in Sarasota, but useful anyway. He was born on October 23rd, 1918, in Elkton, Kentucky. His father, as you've heard already, was a preacher. His mother, an amateur artist, and his family moved frequently. Timothy Rohan, the preeminent scholar of Rudolph, who we've already heard from this morning, has written that he inherited from his father discipline, forbearance, and an unswerving commitment to one's deeply held values which was surely the case. Like many architects, he loved music and considered becoming a concert pianist until, Rohan tells us, he came in second in a national competition in Chicago at the age of 14. When he decided, therefore, he would not be Van Cliburn, he turned quickly to architecture. He was clearly fiercely bright. Rohan also tells us he was exposed to a house by another minister's son, Frank Lloyd Wright, in Auburn, Alabama, that was finished while he was a student at the Alabama Polytechnic Institute. And at 22, he designed a house for a faculty member there that revealed Wrightian influences, not to mention hints of post-war suburban ranch houses and Art Deco mural imagery. Made of a mural made of homosote, a soft fiber board, used as an insulating material, an early sign that he saw absolutely everything as available to him, and that he was not particularly restrained by the traditional dividing lines between high art and low art. Rudolph was ambitious and open to everything. That's the key thing to note here. After he got his degree in 1940, he went to work for Ralph Twitchell here in Sarasota, spent a year or so with Twitchell during which he assisted on many houses, and he surely got to know Wright's campus for Florida Southern in Lakeland, and then left to do graduate work at Harvard. The war intervened, but he did, before he returned to Sarasota, he did fall in with a group of Harvard-trained architects like Edward Larrabee Barnes, Philip Johnson, and John Johansson, and was exposed to the international style. By 1950, he was back in Sarasota and had become Twitchell's partner at age 32. 
Now, again, I'm not going to talk too much about the Sarasota houses, except to say that as a group, they underscore Rudolph's openness to new ideas, his determination not to be a prisoner of a single style. They show an extraordinary compositional sense that would serve him throughout his career and a general tendency toward a kind of lyrical composition. Sometimes lines were straight, sometimes lines were curved. Sometimes houses were dark and sometimes light, but always the pieces fit together in a way that was pleasing, not jarring to the eye. And there's a determination to be inventive, to invent new forms of structure, to use new kinds of materials, to rethink the definition of what is a door and what is a window and what is a facade. The hook house that we see here of 52, 53, the Walker guest house of the same time show the breadth of Rudolph's interest, both new and both so different from each other. Rudolph was developing something, but he wasn't quite sure what it was. Rupert Spade has referred to it as a unique brand of integration between European rationalist thinking and naval pragmatism. A nice observation in that it reminds us that Rudolph admired both the spareness and lyricism of naval design, which his years in the military exposed him to. I'm quite stunned, really, when I look back at this work and see how determinedly inventive it was and how open to so many influences. Rudolph's voracious intellectual curiosity, not to mention his professional ambitions, could not be contained in the partnership with Ralph Twitchell. I don't know for sure what the full story was, but Twitchell may well have considered his former protege something like the Ann Baxter character in All About Eve, the student who pushes aside the teacher. In any case, the partnership ended and Rudolph went off on his own, staying in Sarasota for a while and then heading up north. And there everything began to happen. And what really exploded was Rudolph's interest in finding a way to create a modern architecture that is open to other cultural inf and historical influences and to prove, as to quote Timothy Rohan one more time, that he was more than just an architect of ingenious beach houses. He didn't want to become just a follower of Mies van der Rohe either or a follower of the international style that he had been exposed to at Harvard. He wanted to go his own way, influenced mostly by Wright and to an increasing extent by Le Corbusier, but he was not really a direct follower of either one. In Rudolph's first large public commission for the U.S. Embassy in Amman, Jordan, let's see. Oh. Let's see if we can go back to this. Sorry. There we are. In Amman, Jordan, we see him trying hard to find a way to express some kind of connection to the architectural traditions of the Middle East, while also appearing Western and modern. Not an easy combination, but nothing makes it clearer that this is not an architect who is gonna be satisfied with just turning out white boxes in the name of modernism. There's a little bit of a hint here of Le Corbusier's Maison Jaru in this powerfully monumental design which is quite amazing since the Corbusier building wasn't actually finished yet, although its design may have been known to Rudolph, it's equally plausible that he came up with the notion of these low barrel concrete vaulted roofs on his own. In any event, it was a key moment as he was evolving into an architect whose work was not just moving away from the stark modern box, but was increasingly concerned with monumentality. Monumentality, symbolism, decoration, and so on, age-old human needs are among the architectural challenges that modern art theory has brushed aside, Rudolph wrote, in 1956. You can already feel that this is somebody who is not buying minimalism one bit, or most modernist theory. But Rudolph was hardly a traditionalist either. The American embassy that you saw a moment ago was never built, but soon enough came a key project for Rudolph, the Jewett Art Center at Wellesley College outside of Boston. In my view, one of the key buildings of the 1950s, since it's where Rudolph made his first built work at large civic scale, and in a way that suggested some sincere attempt to connect with traditional architecture. 
with monumentality and with the spirit of this Gothic campus. The Jewett is not a traditional building per se, but its grill work, its sense of rich texture, are all attempts to connect to the quadrangle of collegiate Gothic buildings without directly imitating them. It's a complicated bu building. If somebody asked me to come up with one word for it in a free association test, I guess that word would be texture, the very thing that's lacking in most flat, smooth, international-style buildings. It has weight and gravitas. It also has a certain lyricism. It's not an easy building to describe, but Rudolph's work rarely is. But what you see, what you feel, is this intense desire to respond to old texture with new texture, rather than the absence of texture. To respond to old richness with new richness, rather than with austerity. Austerity, I think we can safely say, was not Paul Rudolph's thing. His architecture has always had a quality of richness to it, and sometimes could even be self-indulgent, even though it always has a consistently formal compositional discipline to it. It's intellectually rigorous, but at the same time, it's hardly restrained. It's intense, it's emotionally engaging. Indeed, what I'm trying to say is that Rudolph's architecture was never emotionally distant. You might not have liked it, and indeed its emotional engagement could sometimes provoke anger, and it could sometimes seem overbearing. Sometimes it could be flamboyant, which did not necessarily win Paul Rudolph any more friends, particularly not among the advocates of cool, minimalist modernism, or among the historicists who saw him, I suspect, as a show-off rather than as a respectful student of the past. Now, this is not really intended to be a biographical talk, and I'm going to speed through a few things here since an awful lot happened after that building at Wellesley. Rudolph had been lecturing and teaching wide, widely in his early years, and in 58, he was offered the job of chairman of the Yale Department of Architecture. Around that time, he received his first Yale commission for the School of Forestry. And before long came what would be, in some ways, the major building of his life, and surely the most famous, and in many ways the most problematic, the art and architecture building at Yale, which he began to design in 1958, and which was completed in 1963. Now, this is a critical building in my own life, since if I can revert to my own biography for one second, I was at that point a 12-year-old in a suburban high school in New Jersey with a vague but not particularly defined but lively interest in architecture. Some family friends, trying to be supportive, gave me a subscription to an architecture magazine as a gift. And lo and behold... When the very first issue of it arrived in 1964, it had Paul Rudolph on the cover, his face juxtaposed against the rough striped concrete facade of the Art and Architecture Building. I had never heard of Paul Rudolph or this building, and if truth be told, I had barely heard of Yale. But it was exciting. This was dramatic, powerful architecture, not a glass box and not an old-fashioned building either, but something that, to me at least, was altogether different. Rudolph's building at Yale was, we might say, the Guggenheim Bilbao of its time, the building that everybody talked about, the building that seemed to be showing a new direction. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, there had been some grumblings about the banality of modernism, about the ubiquity of the glass box, but most of the alternatives were along the lines of what architects like Minoru Yamasaki or Edward Durrell Stone were doing, decorative modernism that seemed fussy. No one could call Paul Rudolph's Art and Architecture Building prissy. It was bold and sculptural and managed the utterly remarkable feat of, being, of brilliantly integrating the influences that meant the most to Rudolph Frank Lloyd Wright, and de Corbusier. Yet this building in many ways is even more than a marriage of different architectural parents. 
It's also a magnificent piece of urbanism. Rudolph himself once said that the building stands on an urban corner and its role in the cityscape is to turn that corner, which it does. And as Vincent Scully has showed us, It is part of a key urban dialogue on Chapel Street in New Haven, begun by Peter B. White's original art gallery, Street Hall, continued by Swartwout's Romanesque Yale Art Gallery, you see the edge of here, and then by Louis Kahn's addition to the art gallery, a sequence so strong that it inspired Scully's memorable definition of architecture as a conversation between the generations constructed over time. And yet, a building is more than a sculptural composition, of course, and it's more than an urbanistic presence also. The art and architecture building, as you know, had a troubled history. It embodies not only Rudolph's great strengths, but also some weaknesses. It has several distinct problems. One of them is materiality, his rough, rough, rough concrete which gave the building its powerful, heavy presence, made it to some people a structure that was not just uninviting, but almost repellent. I must say this is a view I don't share and don't fully even understand. This surface kind of corrugated concrete that Rudolph developed always seemed to me to have a texture that was arguably more humane than the utter smoothness, the machine-like sleekness of so much other architecture of the time. It felt like a crafted object, a thing made to carry weight and to be weighty in itself. You look at this building and you know that it's, in a way, it feels closer to the handmade Gothic buildings that are its neighbors at Yale more than the sleek buildings that seem designed by a computer. To me, the beauty of the composition the exquisite balance of horizontals and verticals and solids and voids, a balance that shows Rudolph at his absolute best, offsets any negatives of the rough, harsh surfaces. But the image of roughness and harshness is still very different from the image of gentility that is projected by the Gothic buildings of Yale or the image of swooping space and scenographic pleasure that's projected by other modern architecture at Yale, like the Ingalls Rink by Eero Saarinen, and say, which was certainly more accessible to the layman. And then, of course, there were all the internal issues of this building, from its confusing and ambiguous entrance to the constant changes in level. There is no doubt that the art and architecture building was designed before the Americans with Disabilities Act, <laughs> since since there are steps and levels everywhere, just so that Rudolph can make the building section as active a composition as its facade. And as the architects got pride of place with all the good interior spaces, the artists and sculptors at the School of Art and Architecture got put in the sub-basement or in leftover spaces above, often with poor light. It's perhaps not so surprising then that in one of the most awkward dedication ceremonies in history, the eminent architectural historian Sir Nicholas Pevsner, who came from Britain to give the keynote speech, all but trashed the building, saying that we must never forget that the client was the architect and the architect was the client. In other words, if you don't like it, you know who to blame. Rudolph reportedly turned bright red, and it was not a happy moment. Um, the embarrassment of the dedication did not get in the way of the extraordinary media attention for the building, much of which was favorable, of course, including the progressive architecture cover that I remembered seeing as a teenager. Both of these things, extraordinary publicity around the world and a less than warm reception at home, led Rudolph to think that maybe it was time for him to move on from Yale. He stayed for two years after the building opened and then relocated to New York, where he would remain for the rest of his life. The saga of the art and architecture building continued, and 
course, Rudolf was replaced by Charles Moore, an architect who, despite his many gifts, seemed determined to position himself as the anti-Paul Rudolph. And he worked hard to portray Rudolph and this building that he now had charge of as the embodiment of American hubris. Moore made no secret of his active dislike of the building. And indeed, as architecture tried to deal with the cultural and political turmoil of the 1960s by trying to demonstrate a higher level of social responsibility, it was easy for him to get away with suggesting that the art and architecture building and Rudolph himself represented the antithesis of this, that they stood for a self-centered arrogance for that Roarchian notion of the architect as the self-involved heroic figure, pre preoccupied with formal invention rather than as a person who cared about making architecture pleasant and entertaining or housing the poor and feeding the hungry. The level of antagonism toward the building in those days made it not so surprising that a fire, suspected to be arson but never proven, damaged the building badly in 1969. Under Moore, as we saw in the film, it was renovated sloppily with little respect for Rudolph's original design. The fault is not only Charles Moore's. As I said, Rudolph made it easy for people to see him as an arrogant figure, even though he was more complicated than that. Even in New Haven, he designed several projects that showed other sides of his nature. It was Crawford Manor, also sculptural, but as housing for the elderly, it ennobled the ordinary people who were its residents, or at least represented a sincere attempt to do this. There was the Temple Street parking garage, which we talked about earlier, as poetic a storage bin for cars as any city has ever seen. And most of all, there was what Ken showed us earlier, Oriental Masonic Gardens, which used trailers or mobile homes as prefabricated units to make up a housing project to which Rudolph added vaulted roofs to make the whole thing seem, well, Rudolphian. Rudolph had long been fascinated with prefabrication and modular construction. That's another side of him that gets overlooked in the simplistic view of him as Howard Roark. In fact, as we saw earlier today, and I'm sorry I don't have an image, but you've already seen it, he even designed a tower to be built out of mobile homes back in his Sarasota days. He was motivated, as Frank Lloyd Wright had been, by a genuine desire to bring serious architecture to the reach of people without the wherewithal to commission a private house from an architect. And he loved the notion of technological innovation, as well as the mix of what we might call high and low cultural influences. But we can see in the Sarasota project, as well as in Oriental Masonic Gardens, the compositional hand always dominating. It's an assemblage made by somebody whose primary goal is always the arrangement of forms, the balancing of horizontals and verticals, of solids and voids, of curves and straight lines, in a way that seems serene and pleasing to the eye. Rudolph himself, told us that in the film we saw earlier when he spoke of that quest for equilibrium. Alas, Masonic Gardens proved not a precursor to more modular housing as Rudolph had hoped, but something of a disaster. It was expensive, the quality of construction was poor, the units were simply not good enough, and Rudolph, true to form, had put what limited budget he had into making the exterior seem finished and handsome rather than into decent bathrooms and kitchens and closets. And occupants were not happy. In 1981, it was torn down in what would be, I think, the first of many demolitions of Rudolph's projects. Now, as I said, my, my objective is not simply to give you his biography or, or to review all of his buildings, but to give you a sense of the arc as well as the breadth of his whole career. As happy as this project was sad, was the house he designed in 1970 in Fort Worth for Sid and Ann Bass, a masterwork, I think, where all of his compositional genius could reach full flower. 
No concrete here, and there's a sleekness one does not always find in Rudolph, but it still has that incredible gravitas, this compositional power, and this sense of being at once uniquely Paul Rudolph and connected to the wider historical framework of 20th century modernism. This wonderful house had an urban counterpart, by the way, relatively little known, even though it's right on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, the townhouse Rudolph designed in 1967 for Alexander Hirsch, later occupied by the fashion designer Halston. There were plenty of other concrete sculptural buildings, like the Boston Mental Health Building, part of the Boston Government Services Center, an exceptionally ambitious scheme for which Rudolph was the coordinating architect and for which he designed an extraordinary tower that was never built, and his southwest, southeastern Massachusetts Technical Institute, which ultimately became a campus of UMass, a true megastructure, housing an entire university, and Endo Laboratories in Long Island, and the headquarters of Burroughs Welcome in Research Triangle, North Carolina, which has a somewhat different kind of sculptural form with lots of slanted columns and walls. In each case, Rudolph was exploring with the, something with the earnestness with which he approached everything. Perhaps most significantly, he was committed to trying to find a new form of urbanism in Boston, one that he thought would be respectful of the need for enclosed squares and noble public spaces, as well as a new form of monumental grandeur that he wanted to be as satisfying as anything the Beaux-Arts had ever dreamed up. Rudolph was surprisingly articulate on this subject. In 1961, speaking in Chicago, he talked of urban architecture, or what we might call today urban design, as, quote, the glaring omission for half a century. In most simple terms, urban architecture means assigning a proper role to each building so that it can work in concert with its neighbors, thereby creating a comprehensible whole. This is the opposite of the, Ma and I'm quoting him still, the opposite of the Madison Avenue view which thinks of each building as a billboard for its owner. It means there must be a focal building, the building which merely completes the missing tooth in the street, the foreground and the supporting building, the building which acts as a pivot, the gateway building, the transitional building. We mistakenly thought the planners would be civic designers. They're not, for their hearts are elsewhere. Architects, Rudolph was saying, needed to take up the challenge. Well, Rudolph's aspirations and his intentions were surely earnest. He may have been respectful of tradition, and I do not doubt for a moment that he, was, he believed he was creating both a viable urbanism and appealing sculptural forms. But not all of them worked well, for the same reason that the Yale Art and Architecture Building, for all its glories, was problematic. Rudolph's architecture was insistent to use a phrase that I don't think was a big part of the language back in his day, it was always in your face. It told you where to go and made you move up and down and around this and over that and behind this and around that, all the while reminding you of its presence in a way that for many people was far too present at every moment all the time. Architecture, even the greatest architecture, is not only about itself. It is a setting for other things, for working, for learning, for healing, for dealing, for worshiping, for eating, for living. It does not have to be a neutral setting for these things, just protecting us from the weather. If that's all it does, there's no point an architecture is not merely an art, but just a set of formulas. But it, at its best, it balances its role as an experience in itself with its obligations to the activities it contains within it and steps back just enough to not get in the way of them. Rudolph's problem, as his career became more successful and as he got more and more work, was that he either did not know or did not want to make architecture that got out of your way. Architecture that stepped aside and achieved that balance between being an experience in itself and being a setting for other experiences. That balance between the container 
and the things it was ostensibly built to contain. When you were in one of the major buildings of Rudolph's high period, you were always conscious of what Rudolph was doing. The architecture, we might say, was about itself as much as it was about whatever was supposed to be going on inside it. Now, this is hardly an issue unique to Rudolph, and surely the architects who mean the most to Rudolph, Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier, did this often enough themselves. And, of course, sometimes the nature of the architectural experience, as in, say, Wright's Guggenheim, is so great and so exhilarating that it more than compensates for any functional shortcomings. I would argue that in Rudolph's greatest buildings, including the Art and Architecture Building at Yale, they do the same. And that this gives us enough of that feeling of awe, that tightening inside your stomach when you know you are experiencing a great work of art to justify a few functional compromises. But that isn't true of all the buildings, and many of them have, we must admit, provided their occupants with as much frustration as awe leading them to feel that the trade-off may not have been worth it. Rudolph's career had an unusual arc. He was a star here in Sarasota. He was invited to head the Yale School of Architecture before he was 40. He was designing buildings all over the world before he was 50. But then at a time when most architects are just reaching their peak, things began to cool off rather dramatically for him. It was less and less work by the late 1970s and early 1980s, in part because the world was really getting tired of modernism and more interested in postmodernism. And while Rudolph was also tired of what we might call conventional glass box modernism, indeed he always had been, his alternative came across as just as arrogant and to many people even more out of touch with a certain kind of human sensibility not to mention out of sync with where architecture seemed at that moment to be going. The fact that Rudolph in his own way was deeply respectful of urbanism and traditions of city building, the fact that he loved monumentality and traditional civic buildings as much as any postmodernist, never got much traction. His buildings seemed dominant, overbearing, far too self-consciously heroic. And indeed, to many people as bombastic. The sense that his work had almost too much drama to it was surely why he had a fall more dramatic than any architect of his generation. I. M. Pei, Edward Larrabee Barnes, Philip Johnson all struggled to deal with changing times. Johnson, of course, famously changed himself constantly. Rudolf changed very little. His enormous intellectual curiosity, technical, te technological curiosity, and sculptural inventiveness didn't go away, but they didn't lead him to new kinds of forms either. He continued to make compositions of extraordinary and beautiful balance, but he also continued to be insistent on formal orders that were often at odds with the way people wanted to live and work and move about within the space that he, that he had in the abstract so beautifully crafted. And so there was relatively little work for him in the United States after a certain point. And his practice was saved. Oh, sorry, this is out of sequence, but it certainly shows you up and down all the time. This is inside the Yale Art and Architecture Building. His practice was saved, at least for a while, by several major projects in Singapore and Hong Kong and elsewhere in Asia, where cities newer to the global stage found in his sculptural forms a kind of fresh calling card. Even that, in time, faded. And in the years before his death in 1997, there was very little work. His office, once housed in a spectacular multi-storied atrium space on 58th Street in Manhattan, had retreated into a portion of the townhouse Rudolph owned on Beekman Place. That house is itself worth talking about for one more moment, since it offers so much insight into what Rudolph really wanted and what he cared about. It was a kind of experimental laboratory for him, and it was, as we saw in the film, and it was full of mirrors and plexiglass and stairways and balconies and lights. It was also unashamedly sensual, even erotic, at once brittle and lush. 
But that, of course, was Paul Rudolph. Brilliant, brittle, driven, and deeply sensual. All of his architecture is about feeling. About how that line and that shape and that light, and most important, about that composition of elements within space, all strike your eye. It is an architecture made to evoke emotion, and it does. And yet its history, and Rudolph's history, is a sad one. I don't think there's an eminent architect of modern times who's lost more of his work to demolition than Rudolph, not just that project in New Haven, but a housing complex in Buffalo, a fine house in Westport, Connecticut, another house in Rhode Island, as you know, a major portion of a high school here in Sarasota, and other projects are threatened. The Orange County Governmental Center in Goshen, New York, was almost lost. The county executive wanted to demolish it and replace it, he said, with a colonial building in the spirit of the community. And while that did not ultimately happen, the compromise that led to the buildings being preserved has also led to its being renovated in a horrendously unsympathetic way. And yet there's also, along with this, some good news. As Rudolph recedes into history, much of his work has benefited from historical distance. And there's been a Rudolph revival, of which you here in Sarasota are leaders. And with that, we can conclude. It all reminds me of Sir John Summerson's great line, referring to the Victorian architecture of England, but just as applicable to Rudolph, when he said, I suppose that all architecture has to die before it can touch the historical imagination. We've seen how much Rudolph's architecture died. Now it is surely beginning to touch the historical imagination. It is poignant that Rudolph himself never lived to see it, but the interest and respect for his work is real, and we've seen it grow over the past decade. We see it in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, where the University of Massachusetts campus has been magnificently restored. We can see it most meaningfully, surely, in New Haven, where under the direction of Robert A.M. Stern, a Rudolph student from the class of 1965 who occupied his mentor's office as dean of the Yale School of Architecture for 18 years, beginning in 1998, the building was magnificently renovated, restored, rather, by Charles Guathme, another alumnus of the Rudolph years. And thanks to the suggestion of the Bass family, whose philanthropy underwrote much of the restoration, the building's name was changed to Paul Rudolph Hall. It is, as I said, a great sadness that Rudolph never lived to see this moment of vindication at Yale, the institution that helped make his reputation, but helped to damage it as well. Now, Paul Rudolph belongs to history. And we see his architecture not as a portent of an overly assertive, overly aggressive form of design, but as a proud cry for poetry in space, for civilization expressed through sculptural power. We can afford to celebrate its formal beauty because that is what we have left, and to celebrate the passion and the curiosity about human creativity that lay behind all of it. In that sense, the end of Rudolph's career comes around to the beginning here in Sarasota, to the love of form, to the belief in making it new, to the idea that architecture, like all of civilization, must always move forward. Thank you.